Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'm bringing you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church, located on the west side of Chicago. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all the officers, the members, especially our Sunday school instructors, we're just so thankful and blessed that you are sharing with us this morning with our Sunday school lesson. We are continuing to share these lessons through our Facebook and YouTube page. And so uh, we're just thankful that you are uh, continuing to grow and uh, build with us as we continue to seek God's will in our lives and understand God's word for our lives. If by chance you're a member of, Sun of a Sunday school class here at Friendship, all of our classes are meeting through our Zoom or conference call. So we encourage you to reach out to the church or reach out to your instructor to get that information. And then, of course, we will continue to push these lessons out virtually uh, until we can get back to some sense of normalcy and return to worshiping inside the building. We have a wonderful lesson today. It's highlighting uh, the weeping prophet Jeremiah uh, and him standing up to the king uh, Zedekiah. When Zedekiah wasn't trying to hear uh, what God had said, he wanted to hear his own words. He wanted to kind of do his own thing. It's second from the 38th chapter of Jeremiah, the 14th, through the 23rd verses, our key verse is Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 15. The text reads, Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I declare it to you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. Amen. We have three goals this morning. First, we will understand why Jeremiah was hesitant to give controversial advice to Zedekiah. Secondly, we will understand Jeremiah's apprehension when talking to Zedekiah. And third, we will commit to giving godly advice regardless of the challenges in our life. Today's lesson is a great illustration of how even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's not uh, in our favor to do so, that we should always speak the truth and uh, speak up for God, give the exact words that God has given us when we're giving advice to other people. And so we're going to begin with prayer and we're going to jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to share in your word. Father, we thank you that you made your word available to us. Now, Father, as we prepare to share together, we ask that you lift us up higher, that we might see you clearer, better understand your will for our lives. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Uh, uh, let all that we do be for your glory and that this understanding be allowed to help us get closer to you so that we can better understand what you would have us to do. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we jump into this lesson, uh, we are again uh, looking at Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Again, Jeremiah is one of the most quote is the most quoted uh, person in the New Testament. His words continue to uh, shed light on the necessity to turn from our wicked ways and properly worship God and worship God in a true spirit, a spirit of truth. Uh, so Jeremiah, this weeping prophet, he was extremely unpopular amongst his peers in the land uh, at the time of our lesson. Our previous lesson and highlighted prophets who remained faithful to God's message while uh, their peers only shared what the kings wanted to hear, even when those words went against the known will of the Lord. And so we had rampant uh, corruption in Israel, specifically amongst the prophets, because instead of doing what God had called them to do, instead of sharing the words that God had shared, uh, called them to share, they were basically just saying whatever was popular, whatever will push their uh, own personal agendas, whatever would gain them favor amongst the kings. And we've had years and years, generations and generations of dynasties falling because they weren't listening to God. They were instead doing their own thing. Uh, these false prophets, they gained favor by indulging the people in the king's desires, encouraging them to constantly go to war and push for actions that would gain uh, earthly glory, earthly wealth, and earthly fame. And these kings continued to listen to these false prophets, ignoring what God had called them to do. In our lesson today, Jeremiah has already prophesied uh, to Zedekiah of the coming attack by the Babylonians, and he shared that the only way for Judah to escape uh destruction at the hands of the Babylonians was for them to surrender. Now, Jeremiah's message was so unpopular that attempts had been made on his life. He had previously been thrown into prison. Zedekiah, now he was the king installed uh, directly by Nebuchadnezzar, the, the second, the Babylonian king. Uh, he was installed by him as kind of like his hand, if you will, but he ran Judah, uh, even though he was a descendant uh, of David's line. And his father was the king. He was handpicked by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar thought that he could control Zedekiah. Now, Zedekiah, as I said, the son of King Josiah, 
Uh, Josiah was the boy king that led reforms during uh, uh, in Judah during his reign. I believe he came to uh, came to the throne at the age of eight, and he instituted these reforms underneath uh, the prophet is holder in conjunction with Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah's role as prophet, uh, he began during the reign of Josiah, the first year of Josiah, but he subsequently saw the next three kings, Josiah's two other sons, other than Zedekiah and his nephew, they were just as crooked as the kings before Je Josiah. So all the reforms that Josiah put into place kind of just will wash down the drain with these subsequent three kings. So Josiah being the 16th king of Judah, his two sons and his nephew, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and then we now we get Zedekiah, the 20th king, all of which uh, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, served over, under all four of those kings. So Josiah, like I said, three sons, one nephew, all who would become king, the, the two sons and the nephew before Zedekiah, they would make up these last four monarchs of Judah that basically their destruction or their disobedience to God led to the destruction of Judah and the destruction of Solomon's temple and the burning of all of Jerusalem. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Babylon he had this uh, kind of United Nations type mindset where what he would do is he would conquer all the lands he would imprison or pull the princes and the kings into his own court. He would rename them and indoctrinate them with his belief systems and then send them out, back out so that he would kind of have his influence over the people he conquered by using the direct uh, descendants of their previous conquerors, their previous kings. And so we see this already happening. The same king that renamed uh, the three Hebrew boys, their original names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he renamed them to their more famous monikers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so jo uh, jo uh, Josiah's youngest son was actually named Madaniah. And then ba uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, renamed him Zedekiah, kind of forcing his influence. And so we see this Babylonian king forcing his influence uh, across the land by renaming people, forcing them to worship him as a god, and just kind of forcing them into worship of idols. And this pushed Judah further away from uh, God. Now, we had already saw the northern kingdom of Israel was already invaded by the Babylonians. And then so it was more of a submissive, uh, a, a submission to the captors, if you will, because they were trying to avoid the same fate that Israel had. And Judah kind of went over a little bit easier, not to mention that Zed Zedekiah's two older brothers, I'm sorry, his two other brothers, and his nephew were already defeated in war trying to fight off the Babylonians. And so he was a lot more reluctant to put opposition up. And so at the time of this text, he had already been serving for at least nine of the 11 years of his reign under the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. And he was consistently ignoring the pleas from Jeremiah to return to true worship and now ignoring the pleas from Jeremiah to surrender to the Babylonians and their incoming, their upcoming invasion because God was fed up with Israel's, the children of Israel, this, this time sp speaking specifically about Judah's rejection of the king. So King, I know that was kind of a lot. I just hope you're still with me and we'll kind of uh, go over some of that as we get into the lesson. King Zedekiah decided to make his own plans outside the will of God, and he forged an alliance between Judah and Egypt, including the areas of Tyre and Ammon. Their kings had convinced him that between their combined might, that they had enough strength and enough manpower to, uh, uh, to kind of fend off the Babylonian incursion, and that they would be actually able to beat the Babylonians if they combined their efforts. So uh, the Zedekiah, seeking to prepare his people for the coming war, he privately summoned Jeremiah, before the throne and asked him what was God's will regarding the upcoming conflict between Judah and Babylon. So this is where we pick off. I'll pick up, excuse me. Our lesson is divided into four lessons. And if you just give me a few moments of your time, I'll believe that we'll be able to understand uh, why Jeremiah was confident and strong enough to deliver words to the king, even when he knew the king didn't want to hear it. So our first part of our lesson is entitled Zedekiah's meeting with Jeremiah. We'll be reading the New King James Version of Jeremiah chapter 38, and we'll begin with verses 14 through 16. The text reads, Then Zedekiah the king sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance of the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you something. Hide nothing from me. 
Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I declare it to you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. So Zedekiah, the king, swore secretly to Jeremiah, saying, as the Lord lives, who made our very souls, I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hand of these men who seek your life. So after being summoned to stand before King Zedekiah, Jeremiah was asked what God's will was regarding the coming war with Babylon. Now, Jeremiah, having spent the majority of his life as a prophet in jail, was hesitant to give a response to Zedekiah, knowing that Zedekiah would only ignore his warnings, but he might even put him to death or deliver him into the hands of the other prophets, the other officials that did not like Jeremiah because his previous prophecies, who would in turn also put him to death. Jeremiah had already come under fire for his prophecies regarding the Babylonians. He had prophesied that Israel only had two options, to surrender to Babylon and allow them to uh, go back into captivity or to fight and face certain death, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the burning, the destruction of the temple of Solomon and the burning of the city of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah's prophecy had landed him in jail again. Now, by the grace of God, the second time being put in jail, an African man by the name of Ebed Melech intervened on behalf of Jeremiah and saved him from death that Jeremiah's enemies had planned for him. Uh, so Jeremiah's enemies had placed him into a cistern. It's like an underground cave or ta cavern where water collects, uh, runoffs or bad water collects. And when they put him in there, this is basically a death sentence, knowing that he would either drown to death or starve to death. But Ebed Malek, he went and uh, solicited the king's or requested from the king if he would be able to pull Jeremiah out and give him a second chance. And so Jeremiah had already faced certain uh, disaster for standing up to the false prophets and telling the truth when no one wanted to hear it. Jeremiah was fully aware that the consequences of his actions might cost him his life, but still he remained faithful to God and the calling that God had placed on his life as God's prophet, his voice to God's people on earth. So they placed him in his cistern, uh, uh, hoping that he would die, but he was pulled out by this black man that was in the court of, of, uh, of the king, Zedekiah. Now, while all of this was going on, the threat of the Babylonian invasion continued to increase. Jerusalem uh, had once again been captured, and King Zedekiah was hoping to find some type of hope in the midst of this horrible situation by again asking the prophet, hoping that Jeremiah would now say that God would deliver them victory over the Babylonians. Now, even though Jedekiah trusted that Jeremiah's words were from the Lord, he worried about the optics of meeting with Jeremiah publicly because of how the uh, public felt about Jeremiah, about how his courts and his royals, the officials in the court felt. So he met with Jeremiah privately so no one would look down on the meeting. Now, Zed Zedekiah secretly sought counsel with Jeremiah so that it wouldn't uh, make him look bad. And this is going to be a constant theme or a constant thread throughout our lesson. That, Jer uh, that Zedekiah is so concerned with how others look at him, what he appears to be in the eyes of others, and he seems to worry about what everyone thinks except God. But again, we'll get to that later in the lesson. Throughout this lesson, King, Jed Jedekiah, De King Zedekiah makes decisions based on the perception of every single person except God. Even his relationship with Nebuchadnezzar was difficult when closely ob uh, observed. Now, the king was responsible, as we said before, for the death of his two brothers and his nephew while on the throne of Judah. His father, Josiah, had been killed in a battle while fighting Egypt. And now this king is making the mistake of switching between sides of Egypt and Babylon, the two very nations that has plagued his forefathers, his uh, brothers, his fathers before him for centuries. When our enemies rise up against us, when they make plans to destroy us and seek to do us harm, we would be wise to trust God and God alone and not give in to the temptation to negotiate a maneuver between evil, thinking that we are protecting ourselves. And uh, there, there's no such thing as a good deal with the devil. I guess that's the best way to put it. And King Zedekiah, instead of doing what God had called him to do, he tried to make his own plans and do his own thing. And we'll see later on the lesson that it eventually cost him his life. 
After so many examples throughout the history of Israel and even throughout the lives of Zedekiah's direct ancestors, we have countless examples of God making the impossible possible for his chosen people. Yet Zedekiah, like many of the kings before him, like his brothers, he chose to focus on what he thought was best, what others were saying, what was popular at the time, and, advice, and took advice from every single person except God and God's prophet. Now, out of frustration and not necessarily disrespect, Jeremiah questions if Zedekiah will even listen to the prophecy after he's asked uh, or 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 if, if Zedekiah would go further than ignoring him, but would even take his life or give him away to the those that wanted to kill him because he would say something that Zedekiah would not like. So Zedekiah was never looking for the truth. He did not even want to hear from God. Rather, he was only looking to validate his own desires and choices. One of the tricks of the enemy is to convince us that our will supersedes God's will in our lives, that we know what's best uh, or we are best equipped to decide uh, our own fate. Here in the text, just like so many of us have been guilty in our own lives, King Zedekiah knows exactly what the word of the Lord dictates, but he is using every opportunity to twist to manipulate or misinterpret God's will in order to do what he wants and what he thinks is best. Unfortunately, if we fast forward to the end of this story, Zedekiah's, ignorant not Zedekiah's ignorance not only cost him his kingdom and all of Judah, but it also cost him his life. Now, thankfully, in our own lives, God's mercy has protected us from the consequences that we are due for being di disobedient to his word, but let us not take for granted God's forgiving nature and instead commit to listening to God's word in our own lives rather than ignoring it because we do not know when God's uh, mercy and grace will run out in our lives. For years, for centuries, God had allowed Israel to fall in and out of favor. God had continued to forgive Israel and give them chance and chance again. And now God has said the time is up. I've warned you, you've ignored my prophet, you've ignored my word, you've ignored the text, you've ignored the law, and now you're going to suffer the consequences for your actions. Uh, 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 sometimes when you're driving down the road and you're speeding, the officer has an option to give you a warning. Uh, but what you don't realize is those warnings go on your record. And if you think you're going to get a second warning in the same jurisdiction, you're, you're, you're well uh, outside of, of being correct. Because they'll say, we gave you a warning before, you didn't listen, and so now it's time to up the punishment. And I've had enough warnings in my life, and God has spared me from the consequences in my life so many times that I pray that I've learned to heed God's word, to listen to God's will in my life, and not be stubborn to the point where I'm facing unnecessary consequences because I want to do my own thing. Uh, so simultaneously, we should also recognize uh, not only that Jeremiah was willing to stand flat footed and tell the truth, but Jeremiah carried out his duties as a prophet in a matter that protected himself, if you will. So Jeremiah didn't avoid the job that God had called him to do. He remained faithful to God and never shied away uh, from boldly telling the truth, even when it landed him in jail. But he didn't just blindly state the truth. Rather, he used wisdom and skill to negotiate and protect his freedom before delivering the prophecy. Now, as Christians, we are taught not to look at what's in it for us or seek to put ourselves uh, first in any situation, when, especially when making deals with other people. But we should be mindful that God has given us a sound mind and we are well within our rights to take advantage of God given opportunities to protect ourselves. This is such a difficult balancing act. But Jeremiah shows us that we can be true to God. God's will for our lives, true to our calling, and still use skill and wisdom to make sound business decisions while remaining true to God. So Jeremiah, he doesn't just simply just blurt out the prophecy. He says, wait a minute, will you promise not to kill me? Will you promise not to throw me in jail? Will you promise not to give me to my enemies? And the king, uh, he agrees to the terms. And so Jeremiah just kind of uses the wisdom that God has given him to protect himself. Uh, we should not be foolish as we operate according to God's will. Yes, we believe that God will fight our battles for us. Yes, we believe that God is the one that protects us. But we also recognize that God has given us a sound mind. And it is by the will of God that we make decisions 
uh, that are smart, that are safe. If it's raining, you don't go outside and leave your umbrella saying that God will protect me. You use the mind that God has given you and the resources that God has made available to you to protect yourself. And that's one of the things that Jeremiah does. So in verses 14 through 16, we see Zedekiah's meeting with Jeremiah. In verses 17 and 18, we see Jeremiah's, excuse me, we see Zedekiah's meeting with Jeremiah. And in verses 17 through 18, we see Jeremiah's message to Zedekiah. So again, reading Jeremiah chapter 38, the New King James Version, starting with verse 17, the text reads, Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. The city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then the city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. So after King Zedekiah promises to spare the life of Jeremiah and not turn him over to his enemies, Jeremiah again delivers the same prophecy that he had previously delivered to all of Judah and to King Zedekiah specifically. If they surrendered to Babylon, they would live and the city would survive. But if they went to battle, the city will be destroyed and God will allow the Babylonians to take the lives of the entire house of Zedekiah. For years, the prophet Jeremiah had pleaded with Judah and all of Jerusalem to return to a true worship of God. The Israelites had become consumed with idol gods and had allowed their regional alliances to infiltrate their culture, their relationships, their marriages, and ultimately their faith. God had lifted Israel above the other nations in order to demonstrate his power and his might. God's chosen people's faithfulness to him would stand as a testament to the blessings and the power of God. Now, when Judah's disobedience became rampant, God warned them time and time again that the consequences would land them in trouble. God specifically said the same way he lifted them up as a testimony of his power to other nations, that he would allow their enemies to conquer them as a testimony of God's wrath and punishment for those that disobey him. Finally, God had had enough, and Judah had two options, surrender and return to captivity at the hands of the Babylonians, or fight and be destroyed. Now, the irony of this prophecy was that the Babylonians' common practice was to destroy both the cities and the peoples that they conquered. But Zedekiah had to have thought that if he surrendered, that Babylon would do what they always did, and destroy the city and kill him. And so in the back of his mind, he used his common sense as a reason to not obey God's word because he thought that surrendering would be more dangerous than trusting God. While the text doesn't specifically recognize it, Jeremiah's prophecy and instruction for Judah puts God's people in position where they are forced to trust that God's way is best, even though it's contrary to their own logic, in their own reasoning. The act of surrender would normally bring about destruction. But in this instance, Jeremiah prophesies that it is the only way that Judah will survive. Even in our punishments, even in the difficult times in our lives, God continues to provide for us and protect us. God continues to offer redemption and salvation for those of us that are faithful during these difficult times. The enemy's trick is to convince us that when we make mistakes, and are held accountable that when things don't go our way, when difficulty arrives, in those times we are abandoned by God and are alone to fend for ourselves. But our text makes it clear. Even when suffering punishment for our own disobedience, even when suffering the punishment from God himself, God continues to protect us even in those punishments. And God saw fit to give Zedekiah and all of Judah an opportunity to be protected in their punishment if they simply learned from their mistakes and started to trust God at that moment. It might be difficult, but we must learn and have the mind that the three Hebrew boys had. When they stood before the same Babylonian king under threat of death for refusing to bow at the golden idol, they boldly proclaimed to Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know if my God will, but I know that my God can. 
The king had ordered them to be thrown into a fiery furnace that was turned up hotter than it had ever been turned up before. And they stood flat footed, refusing to bow to a false king, refusing to worship idol gods, trusting that in the midst of the right decision, God had the ability to protect them. These attitudes birthed out of a refusal to accept defeat or a refusal to recognize when we are wrong can do so much damage and destroy so many lives. When we choose to annoy truth, when we choose to forge ahead, knowing that victory is out of reach, we are choosing to go down with the sinking ship rather than accept that, accept that God simply has something else for us. I must confess that I have not always understood what God was doing in my life. I might not have even liked what God was doing in my life. As a matter of fact, if it was up to me and I had my choice, I might have done things very differently. But I can boldly testify today that God has proven time and time again that his way is always better than my way and that I am best operating within God's will even if what I want or what I desire is not in those plans. I wish I could promise you that all of us will be rich, that we will all drive fancy cars and live in fancy homes, but that is just not the will of God for all of our lives. And when we don't get what we want, when we don't get what we desire, instead of being upset with God, instead of ignoring the will of God in our lives, what we should focus on is aligning our lives with God, having a heart that is of God, doing what God has called us to do and adjusting our desires based on God's will. And I promise you, we will have a peace and a joy that we've never understood before. Our peace and joy comes from operating within the will of God and not simply doing what we want in our own lives. So we see in verse 14 through 16, Zedekiah is meeting with Jeremiah. In verses 17 and 18, we see Jeremiah's message to Zedekiah. But in verse 19, we see Zedekiah's fear of the Jews. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 19 reads, And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand and they abuse me. So in verse 19, Zedekiah reveals his fear of death at the hands of his own people. Now at the age of 21, Zedekiah was appointed king by Nebuchadnezzar. For nine years, he remained faithful and paid his tributes to Nebuchadnezzar. But because of Babylon's conquering of the northern kingdom of Israel, coupled by the constant lobbying of the southern African kingdoms and their kings, Zedekiah believed that his alliances, along with the might of the Egyptians and surrounding nations, would be enough to overcome the Babylonians and finally put an end of their crusades to conquer all of Israel. Now, during the time, Judah became more fractured than ever before. The allure of the Babylonian Empire, the uh, wealth and the freedom that, he, that Nebuchadnezzar promised, coupled with the fear of their might, called many residents of Judah to defect, if you will, and surrender to the Babylonians, even taking up arms in the Babylonian army, which presented Zedekiah with a very difficult situation. Even if he were to surrender, coupled with the nature and the history of the Babylonians as destroyers of all they conquered, Zedekiah was fearful that the Israelites who had already uh, surrendered uh, would call for his execution because of this prolonged war and the failure to surrender earlier, which would have prevented countless losses of lives. The irony is that these officials and leaders that Zedekiah was now afraid of, the ones that surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar, were the very same people that had counseled and persuaded Zedekiah to ignore Jeremiah and the words of God, which is the reason that Zedekiah and Judah were in the situation they found themselves in. When I was young, my great-grandmother was ever suspicious of all my friends and my friendly nature. She would always warn me about getting close to people that weren't my friends or people that I didn't know. Now, I thought her warnings were birthed out of an isolationist attitude or introverted attitude, or perhaps she just didn't want me to have too much fun. The truth was that my grandmother recognized how vulnerable we all are when it comes to peer pressure, and even the most strong-willed or independent person can testify that at least once we've fallen and went along with the crowd when we didn't necessarily think it was the best choice. We can testify that we've allowed our minds and our decisions to be swayed by those that are close to us. 
My grandmother, my great grandmother recognized that everyone's moral compass doesn't necessarily point in the same direction. And she was worried that when I was put in a position to make a difficult or challenging decision, that there would be non-Christian voices influencing my choice. In our texts, we learn a valuable lesson from King Zedekiah. For years, he ignored the words of God and listened to those people who only spoke selfishly and for their own gains and spoke the words that he wanted to hear. Now these very same people had turned on him, surrendered to the very enemy that he... That that they convinced him to turn against, and now Zedekiah was convincing himself that if he was obedient to God's word, that who he once called friends would seek to call for his life uh, through execution. We must be careful about bandwagon friends. In a world in which our actions seem to be directed by uh, the responses we get on social media and what is culturally acceptable or popular at the time, we must stay true to the only thing that remains constant in our lives, and that is the word of God and the promises contained within. While it may be comfortable or even easy to go with the crowd, as Christians, we must recognize that history, both biblical and our own, has taught us that the one voice that we must listen to and follow is the voice of God. Even when we find ourselves enticed or entertained by the logic and truths of this world, we must remain faithful to God and see uh, through the lies and deceit uh, of the world, recognizing that God's way is the only way. Finally, in this 19th verse, the we are shown the dangers of being more concerned with man's consequences for our actions than we are concerned with God's consequences for our actions. Zedekiah uh, f to be a king, he was a mighty foolish man. He listened to everybody but God. He listened to the very kings that killed his father. He listened to the very king that killed his brothers. He listened to the naysayers, the false prophets that had landed him in trouble time and time again. He listened to the popular opinion at the time, and he seemed to hear everyone's voice except the prophet and the word of the Lord. And my brothers and sisters, when we are willing to listen to lies and ignore the truth at every hand, it can only lead us down a path of destruction. And it eventually costs Jerusalem their city, it eventually costs them their temple, and it eventually costs Zedekiah his life. So finally, as we end this lesson, in verses 14 through 16, we had Zedekiah's meeting with Jeremiah. In verses 17 and 18, we had Jeremiah's message to Zedekiah. In verse 19, we saw Zedekiah's fear of the Jews but now in verses 20 through 23, our final four verses, we see Jeremiah's second message to Zedekiah. Again, reading from the 38th chapter of Jeremiah, the text reads, But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord which I speak to you. So it shall be with you, and you shall live. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the word that, you, that the Lord has shown me. Now behold, all the women who are left in the king of Judah's house shall be surrendered to the king of Babylon's princes, and those women shall say, Your close friends have set upon you and prevailed against you. Your feet have sunk in the mire, and they have turned away again. So they shall surrender all your wives and children to the Chaldeans. You shall not escape from their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and you shall cause this city to be burned with fire. Amen. In these final four verses of our lesson, Jeremiah explains uh, the means by which Zedekiah will be destroyed if he obeys God's will, ignores the prophecy, and goes to war with Babylon. Recognizing the soundness of Zedekiah's reasoning and thinking that the surrender would bring about his death and destruction, Jeremiah assures the king that God is true to his word and that the surrender of Judah would bring about their protection and not their destruction. Uh, I once uh, learned that the acronym for fear is uh, false expectations appearing real. Zedekiah had determined in his own mind what the consequences would be if he surrendered. And he allowed his false hypothesis co to convince him to obey God. Now, I want to use uh, the hypothesis because uh, in a scientific term, we make educated guesses based on the knowledge that we have. The knowledge that Zedekiah had was that Babylon normally destroys all they conquer, even when they surrender. The knowledge that Zedekiah had 
was that Babylon normally kills the reigning conquerors of those that surrender. The knowledge that Zedekiah had was that the people that convinced him to stand against Nebuchadnezzar would probably try to kill him because they were fearful of him, of them leading him astray, and they were fearful that he would try to rise up again and go against them for surrendering early. He had all these suppositions based on what he thought he knew, yet there was one constant that he avoided. Everything I just listed is a variable. It might happen and it might not. It's not guaranteed to happen. That's what we call variables. You really don't know what you're going to get. But in the life of a Christian, we have a constant. A constant is something that doesn't change, that remains the same, that can't be affected by circumstances. The constant in the life of King Zedekiah was that God remains faithful to his people and that God is true to his word. The moment that the prophet Jeremiah told Zedekiah the king that God would protect them if he surrendered, that was the only uh, knowledge that was necessary to make the decision. In our lives, we cannot be fooled by fear false expectations appearing real. Fear will make you lock yourself in your home because of the violence in our streets. Fear will convince you that uh, we can't uh, trust vaccines because of the history of medicals uh, and the medical community with the African American community in our, in our nation. Fear will convince us that we are not able to handle the attacks of the enemy that are headed our way. But there is a constant in our life. That constant is God a God that will never leave us or forsake us. And so we should not give in to fear because fear is a variable that we don't know. But we do know the truth. We do know the one constant in our life, and that's God's will supersedes every other will in our life, that God's way is the only way. And so Jeremiah, excuse me, Zedekiah was mistaken by looking at the wrong variables. All he had to do was look at the constant and trust that God's will was best. Jeremiah specifically illustrates the details of humiliation through conquering, through rape, through execution, that Zedekiah and his family would endure by disobeying God's will. Jeremiah's disobedience, excuse me, Zedekiah's disobedience to God was based on listening to those that lied and betrayed him. And now facing the destruction of his people, his concerns are based on what those same betrayers will think and demand of him rather than protecting his kingdom, his family, and even himself. Zedekiah's wickedness, his attempts at self-preservation, his refusal to heed the words of God caused him to be stuck and dug in like a car stuck in the mud, spinning its tires, not moving forward or backward, but just sinking deeper in the mess he found himself in. Zedekiah's actions caused the death of his sons, his family, his own execution, starting with his eyes being plucked out after witnessing his heirs executed and the destruction of Solomon's temple, along with the burning of all of Jerusalem. Zedekiah, a descendant of David, was the last king, and his actions ended the dynasty because of his refusal to obey God's word. In conclusion, in our own lives, we must commit to not only hearing God's word, but also sharing God's word in truth. God's word has the power to encourage us and to empower us, but also to lead us to direct us, to challenge us, and to correct us. Ignoring God's word was a constant challenge for Israel. Here in our lesson, we see the consequences of their rejection and the subsequent punishment that God delivers upon them. What is encouraging is that even in this disobedience, even in this punishment, God continued to offer opportunities for salvation and reprieve. All of us have work to do in our own lives. We are all disobedient in our own way, and we all fall short of the glory of God. But based on today's lesson, our prayer should be for God to reveal his will in our lives, to give us the strength to be obedient to his will, and to take the opportunities that God provides for us to correct our mistakes, operate within his will, and not our own. Our two characters in our lesson, Zedekiah ignored the words of the prophet, he made the same mistakes that his father, excuse me, his two brothers and his nephew made. He allowed the other kings of the other tribes, of the, the southern, the African kingdoms, to convince him to go against the will of God. He ignored God's opportunity for protection in the midst of his punishment. 
He was fearful of man's consequences more than he was of God's consequences. Conversely, Jeremiah was faithful to God, carrying out his job as God's prophet to a serious series of wicked kings, even though it landed him in jail numerous times and turned his people against him. Jeremiah was smart enough to negotiate his freedom before delivering the prophecy a second time, and Jeremiah trusted that regardless of what it looked like, regardless of the dangers of being true to God's word, that God will protect him for being a faithful servant. Our prayer today is that God will give us the strength to have the heart of Jeremiah, to stand firm on God's word, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's dangerous to do so, trusting that God's will, that God's way is the safest place to be. And the irony is that Jeremiah, the hated prophet, the one that everyone sought to kill, the one that everyone sought to destroy is the one that survived this encounter because he remained true and faithful to God. What a wonderful lesson. Uh, praise God for you for sharing with us this morning. Our prayer is that you are encouraged and strengthened by God's word and that God's will for your life be revealed through his word and that we all be encouraged to stand boldly on God's word operating according to what God says and no one else. Uh, we praise God for you for sharing with us this morning. Please continue to support our other worship experiences. You can support us through our, uh, our Sunday morning worship at 11 a.m. Each Sunday, our pastor, Dr. Backus, preaches an amazing word. Our Wednesday evening Bible classes uh, under the tutelage of our pastor, Dr. Backus, we're currently going through the miracles of Jesus Christ each Wednesday night at 6 p.m., on Facebook and YouTube. Tuesday morning, our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson, leads a mighty group of prayer warriors in prayer. Uh, it's an amazing time of just listening God's will for our lives and just calling out our desires and our cares to the Lord, placing them in God's hands and leaving them there. And then, of course, we praise God for those of you all that are supporting our church through giving. We have four ways to give here at Friendship. You can look at the graphics on your screen. Uh, you can give through our website, fbcchicago.org. Use the giving tab in the upper right corner. You can use uh, the cash out, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago. You can text the word give to 773-992-1462, or you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, care of Pastor Reginald Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 606. For, for. for all of you all who have given and continue to support this ministry, we praise God and are so thankful for your gifts. And for those of you all that are considering and thinking of giving, this is a wonderful place to sow a great seed on fertile ground. And it is amazing, amazing work and ministry going on here. And we encourage you to allow God to use you to be a blessing here so that we can be a blessing to others. Uh, again, we encourage you to join us at 11 a.m. for our worship service. May God continue to bless and keep each and every one of you. May God continue to let his face shine upon you. And may all that we do give God glory in our lives. We'll dismiss with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your will in our lives. Father, we must admit that we have not always done things right that we have stumbled and made mistakes, but we thank you right now that even in our punishment, even in our mistakes, you give us opportunities to make it right, to ask for forgiveness and to operate within your will. So Father, no matter how much we've drifted away, no matter how far we've drifted away, Father, just grab us back, wrap us in your bosom, protect us, send angels out before us, just block the attempts of the enemy to distract us and help us to operate within your will, not ours. Help us to do what you would have us to do and not what we would want to do. Help us to trust your word, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's uncomfortable. Trusting that your word is better than any other word. Give us the strength of Jeremiah to stand flat-footed and boldly proclaim the truth, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's unpopular. And we'll be sure to understand that your peace, that your comfort, and your protection is ever-present in the lives of your obedient children. Father, let your will be done in our lives. Bless us and keep us. And as we leave from this place, continue to wrap your loving arms around us. Let all that we do be for your glory, that others might see our good works, but glorify you who is in heaven. And we'll be sure to praise your name in our living and on our lips at all times. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Have an amazing, wonderful week. We'll see you at 11 a.m. for service. 